Well, I got a lot of Bible verses to show you today, and uh, it's always good to see the Word of God, to read the Word of God yourself, because that's the one that encourages us, that's the one that gives us the life, that's the one that takes away the fear and the doubt that the enemy likes to throw at us. So my message today is the church is the hope of the world, chasing away the darkness. Hallelujah. With our Lord Jesus Christ, we are able to do that. So let's start right away on Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men and women, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Oh, hallelujah. So whenever you speak the word of God, speak it with authority and love, of course. Don't yell and scream at them when you present the gospel to other people. Because this is, uh, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's important for us to remember that. Reminds me of a story, I think you heard this one before. This, uh, the husband uh, figured that his wife was hard of hearing. She, she couldn't hear too good. So he was going to test her. So she was sitting on the couch there, and he walked out of the room by the door. And he says, honey, can you hear me? There was no answer. So he steps halfway into the room. Honey, can you hear me? Still no answer. Walked closer. Can you hear me now? Still no answer. Then he went real close to her and says, Honey, can you hear me now? She looked at him and says, For the fourth time, I can hear you. <laughs> but this is the way we think about our Lord, don't we? we? We think that he don't hear us, but it's actually us that don't hear him. You know, so this is so important for us to recognize that. There's a parable that we have in the Bible, a lot of parables there, but there's one parable about the fig tree. Take a look in Luke chapter 21, verse 29 through 31. And then he told them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Oh, hallelujah. Let's go down to verse uh, 30. What is it? I have it written down here somewhere. The next section. Okay, 34 through 36. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, and that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of all the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So we see as, as the nature gives us signs, gives us signals, like the fig tree and other trees, leaves come first and then the fruit comes. And so I was thinking about this and I thought, well, Lord, you had this olive discourse on the Mount of Olive. And so how about if we go and look into that again? Because these are signs of the end time. The Lord is coming soon. We don't know when. We don't have to know when. We just have to be ready. 
So take, take a look at the passage in, in Matthew 24. This is quite lengthy, but it's the whole discourse of, of the, the Lord Jesus that he gave his disciples on the Mount of Olives. Okay, Matthew 24, verse 3 through 27. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. You see that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away, and will betray one another, and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand this, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But who, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will be not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, and do not go out, or Behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So hallelujah. These are all signs that we see as we saw this, the parable of the fig tree. These are signs of the coming of the Lord, and I believe we're, we're pretty close to it. There are so many signs that have fallen in place also. But these could also just be birth pangs. So the, the birth of the resurrection, not of the resurrection, of the coming of the Lord again might be shortly, might, be take, might, not, might take a little while. But we know already that the government, many of them, are against Christians. And you know why? Because a lot of churches don't pay taxes. And the government don't like that. The government loves the money. And as many things, many nations have fallen apart because of being overtaxed. Taking money from people away more and more. And that's something that the Lord is trying to to help us to understand. that This is a time where you're going through. Yeah, it's not easy. 
And he allowed this virus to come into this world. He didn't create it, but he allowed it to come. And I believe part of that is to wake up his church. Because we are the ones that have the hope for everybody. There are a lot of people out there who don't have any hope at all, you know. And that's the sad part. So take a look on Matthew chapter 16. Now, wait a minute. I had that one here. Now, let, yeah, let me go to this one first of all. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. <laughs> yeah, this is a good one. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me. This is Paul, of course, talking to Timothy. Because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's our theme song at the Bible study at the end. <laughs> Now, there was a, an article some time back in the London Times, and it posed this question to readers. What's wrong with this world? Now, the paper received a number, number of responses, but there was one brief one from the English writer, poet, and philosopher, G.K., Chesterton, he wrote four words. He said, wrote down and says, Dear sirs, I am. What's wrong with this world? Here was somebody who recognized that he was. And so as we see with Paul, Paul recognized who he was before the Lord took him into his kingdom. He was, like he says, the greatest sinner. He was the one that what was wrong. He is the one that, that knew what was wrong in this world. It's us. It's us. We are all born sinners. And sin came into the world. And because of that, we have a broken world not the way the Lord wanted it to be. But because choices were made that way at the beginning, and ever since then, we have nothing but problems. Sicknesses, diseases, death, and all these things came into the world because of sin, because of disobedience, because of wanting to do their own thing. And a lot of us grow up that way, wanting to do our own thing, don't we? But once we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, oh, hallelujah, what happened? Things began to change. But there again, we make that choice. You know, we don't have to go all the way. Do I have to lay down my whole life? Can I have part of it? <laughs> you know, this is what the Lord wants us to do. He gave himself for all of us. He died for all of us. And he is the one that asks of us, lay down your life, as we will see here in a minute. I got some scriptures here also from, uh, to, from verse uh, 16, I mean Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. And it talks about our Lord building his church. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, 
who do, we, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now, there are a lot of misunderstanding there, and it's sad to say people misuse it, that they say that Peter is the one that will build the church. But that word Peter in Greek is interpreted as a pebble, while the Lord himself is the rock. So when he talked to Peter like that, he pointed to him. You know, that he, he is the one that will, will raise up the church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not, what? Overpower it. Now, the, the gates of hell, it symbolizes the organized power of death, of, of death and Satan. And so we are overpowering him. Why? Because Jesus is the one that conquered. Jesus is the one that, that today overcame the enemy. Now, Christ is the architect, as we, we know, we should know. He's the organizer of the church. It was his idea. He protects and leads it. And it says he will build it. In other words, the term build suggests only a beginning, but it's also an ongoing process. And so the Lord is still building his church. There are still people that are willing to, and make the choice to come and enter into his kingdom, into his church. The overall church in the world, not just one particular local church, no. It's the church that's in this world. All true believers, all true believers who, who are called out of this darkness, out of this world, who are willing to follow the Lord Jesus and so it's important for us to understand this ourselves, and I'm sure most of you do. Now, when he says, my church affirms the ownership and the authority. He is the head of the church. Take a look in Colossians 1, verse 16 through 18. It says, for by him, meaning the Lord, by him things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Jesus Christ is the one that builds the church. He is the one that provides everything for the church. He is the one that watches over the church. He is the one that guides the church. He is the one that loves the church. He is the one for us, every one of us who are born again Christians. So he is the head of the church. Now, if he is the head of the church, is he your head? Is he your Lord? Is he really your Lord? You know, if he really is your Lord, then we must obey him. Then we must do what he tells us to do. Because he is in charge. He is the head. He is the Lord. And everything belongs to him. He created everything. There is nothing, nothing out there that he did not create. He created you and me for a purpose. And you are here for a purpose. You're here in this world to bring hope to this world. You have the darkness tremble, like we sang that song. 
And darkness does tremble when we stand firm on the ground that the Lord has given us. And that's why the enemy is so strongly at work against Christians, true Christians. The enemy tries to destroy what the Lord is building up. The enemy is there to entrap us. He's persuading people, even believers, to lose their first love. What's the first love? The first love is when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Why? Because we recognize how much he loves us. And we love him back. But as we grow, become older, growing more and as, as Christians, you might say, and receiving a lot of teachings, educations, and all kinds of things from the Word of God, it just becomes numb. Why? Why do we become numb? Yeah. See, God, God loves us so much, we shouldn't lose our first love. We should increase that first love. We should love him more and more and more and more and more. There should be no end of love towards him. That's what he likes for us to be like. He loves that. He loves that when we love him, when we praise him, when we worship him. And, of course, the enemy don't like that. That's, that's why it's, it's such a, a thing of who is Lord in your life? Who, who is your priority in your life? There are many things that come in our way that we have to do certain things, of course. And we think about, well, let's see what I'm going to do tomorrow. We plan ahead of time and all these things, even though we don't know whether we still be here. Well, there's, there's nothing wrong with those things to plan ahead. But the point is, is he still the priority in your life? Before you do all those plans that you have, would you ever come before him and talk to him? We come with him, including myself, a lot of requests that we have, a lot of wishes that we have and all. And there's nothing wrong with that. But do we ever take time to be silent and listen? what he's trying to tell us. That's the hard part, isn't it? And there are all kinds of interferences that the enemy throws our way, whether it be phone ringing or if you have children in the house or whatever, all of a sudden other things pop up into your head. Oh, yeah, I forgot to do this, and oh, I should do that, and instead of focusing on the Lord. It's, it's a great thing when you... Read the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God, and he asked the Holy Spirit, help me, Holy Spirit, to understand this better. And then sit back and listen. Be open-minded to him. Don't have anything else interfere. Just stand firm on what the Lord has given you, has provided for you. Oh, hallelujah. You see, like uh, at the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2, let's take a look at that, verse 42 through 47. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, when we do what the Lord asks us to do, he will provide. He will send people in. He will raise up the church the way it's supposed to be. 
And that's the beautiful part. We see here that there, there are so many different things that, that we see here. That is the teaching, of course, is important. The fellowship, very important. That's why the government is trying to cut down on closing churches. And the enemy, of course, is behind that so that we don't fellowship with one another. But the Lord asks us, don't not neglect coming together. Why? Because we need the fellowship with one another. We need to encourage one another. We need to love one another. We need to be so that the world can see, oh, look, and see how much they love them, how they are there for each other. And that attracts them. And they want to be part of that kind of community, wouldn't you? And it's the prayer and, of course, the praise and the evangelizing. I mean, there, there are so many things that, yeah, we can talk about it and bring the words, the gospel to the people. But when people see your action, you know, then hallelujah. I want part of that. I heard something the other day that uh, uh, the atheists, uh, you know, and people who are against Christians. And now we should ask them, does your group raise up orphans, orphanages? Does your group provide food for those who have need? Does your group provide clothes for those who have need? Think about that. They're complaining about us, they're hating us, yet they themselves, they wouldn't do things like that. We do it because we love the Lord. And they should recognize that, but because of them probably feeling guilty, don't want to be under any authority, they want to do what they want to do, which is, of course, is part of Satan's influence, as we all know. Oh, hallelujah. You know, we, we have a little brochure out there in the back. I don't know if you ever took one, if you ever noticed. The function of our fellowship is it's a dwelling place for God, most of all. It's a working unit. We're working together. We're trying to raise up th uh, more people who are willing to serve the Lord in different areas that we have need of, like for our youth group and Sunday school and stuff like that. It comes together for praising, for equipping, empowering, and gifts. It's a spiritual school to learn Christ and to disciple others. It's a spiritual hospital to restore to heal. It's a spiritual deliverance center for POWs, those who are caught in the trap of the enemy, who are still prisoners of the enemy, to help them to become free. And most of all, it's a spiritual home. This, this is your home, your spiritual home. You want to be kicked out of your home? I don't. <laughs> God wants us to come together to have a home, to have fellowship with one another. It's so important for us. Yeah, we lost a lot of influence when uh, the government closed uh, uh, closing the schools now too, yeah, but uh, stopped the, the Bible reading in schools and, and all kinds of different influences that uh, shows that they don't like Christians. And it's a sad thing because the way this country started, and that's what attracted me to come to this country, with God and his word. And this country was blessed. And how many, how many missionaries have been sent out from this country into the world to bless others? And how many orphans have been raised up from Christians to help children who need, who need something, who need to be recognized, who need to be encouraged, who need to be loved. But you see, Satan is trying to entrap us. It's like, like a hunter. I'm not a hunter, but I understand that some hunters, they dig a hole and they put the leaves or whatever branches over the hole and they put a bait in front of it. And so that when the, the animal comes, they, they go for the bait and shoop, slip into the hole and they got him. Well, that's the same thing the enemy does with us, you know. He makes things attractive. He has the whole all set for us, makes things attractive to us, and, and the world doesn't recognize that, of course, and they're already caught. 
But for us Christians, for us true believers, he is there to entrap us. And you know what, what he does? Cuts this supply line. What does that mean? I was reminded of World War II when the German army came against the Russians. And they were going all the way into close to Moscow. Actually, they were right on the border of Moscow, the city, which is quite a way up. I don't know how many thousand miles from, from Germany, but it's, it's quite a way up there. And so since they were there, they were so far away, they couldn't get the supplies. So what they had to do? Well, they, they, for instance, they had no, the shoes were all worn out from all that walking there and all that kind of stuff. So they, whatever, they could find some cloth, potato sacks or whatever, wrap around their feet to keep their feet warm. And so what happened? They drew back, they drew back, they drew back more and more and more because the supply was not coming in. That's what Satan is trying to do to us. Our supplier is up there. He's supplying us. And the enemy is trying to block that, that, that supply coming into us. How does he do that? By us doubting, by us having fear, by us not really trusting in the Lord. You see, we, we have to be, be very careful as we read the, the, the discourse on Mount Olive there, what Jesus was saying. There many, many will come and mislead you. Many will come and, and uh, pro prophesy the wrong things. And many, many Christians will fall away from the Lord. Why? Because they're not hooked up to the supply, to the supplier, the line of supply has been broken. Why? They're not really, they're not really wholeheartedly have given themselves to the Lord. You see, there's such a thing as carnal Christians. A carnal Christian is, is uh, half born again, you might say, and, and other half still work doing things in the world, like what the world does, like Paul was saying in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You've been so many times with me, and I taught you so many times, and yet you're still acting like the people in the world, arguing and fighting and, and you know, coming against one another. The love, the love is not there. The love has been lost. And this, this is the time when the Lord is telling his church to wake up, show who I am, what I have done for you. Do you still love me? Do you still want me? Do you still serve me? The Lord needs you and me to be in this world. If you really trust the Lord with all of your heart to be that light that the world needs, to bring them that hope that the world needs. But if they know you, your home life or whatever, the way you act just like the world does, they just shake it off. doesn't mean anything. But if you're willing to reach out to them, helping them, whatever needs they may have, and bring the love of Christ to them, then, you might have, then we might have a chance, don't we? You know, in, in Luke uh, chapter 10, verse 17 through 20, the, the, Jesus sent the disciples out to minister to people, and they returned with joy. Why? What happened? They said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, which of course is the enemy and his demons, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Now, how would you feel like you going out and minister to somebody and deliver somebody from, from a demon? 
or put your hands on them and they get healed instantly. Wouldn't you come back rejoicing? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Yes, I would. I would. Now, why is the Lord saying this? Why is the Lord saying this? You see, their focus was more on what they could do. Yes, it was in the name of Jesus. They had the power. They had the authority. And they were seeing miracles happen. And there's nothing wrong with that. The Lord is not saying against anything of that. That's what we're supposed to do. But the most important part is that he has given us eternal life to be in heaven forever and forever with him. So don't lose that focus. Even if you are uh, enjoying or if you are able to help somebody to be delivered from the enemy, help somebody to be healed and all these things, that's great. But the glory belongs to the Lord. And always focus on the Lord. Don't focus on that. Yes, we like to see miracles, don't we? Yes, we like to see healings come forth in here. Yes, we like to see people who need deliverance to be set free from that. But let's never forget it's all because of him. And that's, that's what he had to warn the disciples about these things. To be recognize your priority, to, to see what the Lord has done for you. Now let's go to Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27. And we see in here how the Lord is preparing his church as part of it. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That's us. No spot, no wrinkle, holy and blameless. We got to work on that, don't we? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a thing of, of uh, well, how can I say it? It takes time, let's put it that way, to get trained through the Word of God. And that's what it's all about. We're, we're in training season. All of us Christians, we're in a class and we're getting trained. And we might move up from grade one to grade two, grade three, and so on down the line. But we'll never be perfect. But we can always count on the Lord to be with us and helping us, ministering to us and through us if we are willing to give ourselves to him. The Lord says, if you are for me, I'm for you. If you're against me, I'm against you. That's important for us to recognize that. And it's important for us to see that he sanctifies the church. And this is something for us husbands also to remember that, that what he said there, lay down your life like he did for the church. So husbands, Lay down your life for your wife. <laughs> That's hard sometimes for us men because a lot of pride in us, isn't there? And we want to be right. We're the head of the household. So you do what I say or else. <laughs> no. God says, the way I treated the church, my church, the way you should treat your wives. That means he laid down his life for the church. And so we as men must lay down our lives for our wives also. And this is something that the world also will pick up. You know, when you witness to somebody and they know you, they know your situation at home and all. They're just thinking, yeah, yeah, you talk a lot, but where is your action? <laughs> you know, so we, got, we have to be very, very careful with all this stuff. Oh, hallelujah. And then there's, uh, there's another one. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 14 through 16. So as a result, in other words, when, when we have been discipled, when we have accepted the gifts that the Lord has provided for us in, in 4, 
you know, apostles and prophets, uh, evangelists, teachers and preachers and all that kind of stuff. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, which causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Working together, joint supplies. Yeah, how hallelujah. Ligaments, or lig, I think that's what the name is, hold together the joints. You know, you go over the joints, holds it all together. And so the Lord is using this example that we in love should hold together, stay true to him, and not to give up, not to believe what the world is trying to to coax us into what Satan most of all is using the world to coax us into things to go back and to be what the world is like. But you see, the thing is, Christians are the called out of body of the redeemed mankind to spread the good news in this world to bring them the blessed hope. So I hope that today somebody is out there that you can talk to. Somebody out there who needs, who needs some hope, who needs some encouragement. This is what the church is all about. The Lord is cleaning up the church, and we see in Revelations that we ourselves have to give in to the Lord and get ourselves prepared for the groom. We are the bride, and he is the groom. And so we must prepare ourselves by laying down our lives for him and being there for him and recognizing that in this dark world, the world needs that light to come into and shine more and more. Wherever you are, there's all of a sudden there's a light there and the darkness will flee. The darkness is trembling, but they're not giving up. They're trying to cut your supply line. They're trying to cut you away from coming together, encouraging one another, loving one another. The biggest thing that, that you find in the, in the Bible is love. Love. Why? Because God is love. Yes, he's also just. Yes, he can be strict. He can be a disciplinarian, but all because of love because he wants us to become more and more like him. God loves us so much. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, let me just close with this particular verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Keep that verse in mind. That should be an encouragement to all of us, never to give up, to be steadfast, no matter what's going on around us, to be there for the Lord, to encourage others, encourage your brothers, your sisters, of course, and then help to reach out into the world to bring more into the kingdom of God. And the enemy will fight you. There's no doubt about that. So don't give up. Don't let him shake you off. Like, like I talk about the armor of God. Yes, we should have the armor of God always on. But there's one thing that we don't have in the back. There's no covering of the back. So don't turn around. Don't give up. Don't run away from the enemy. Because he will get you when you turn your back on him. Those fiery darts fly into you. So stand firm on the ground that the Lord has given you. 
You, you, you are a Christian, you are a solid Christian, and God has provided you that ground to stand firm on, whether it be in your family, in your community, wherever. That ground is your ground that the Lord has given you, and you are in charge of that. Now, you can run away from it, give it up, or can stand, stand, stand steadfast with the Lord and say, take the sword of the Spirit and knock the enemy off with the Word of God by praising and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. He hates that. The enemy hates that when we worship and praising God. He don't like that. That's why I, I suggest, if possible at all, have some good Christian praise songs playing in your house, in your room, wherever you are. Because that, that's part of the covering. The Lord, of course, is our cover, covering us with his blood, with the sacrifice. But as we praise and singing along with these songs, or at least hearing these songs, they're coming into us, they minister to us, and the enemy just, whew, he can't stand that when we praise and worship God. All right, well, I think this is all I have to say right now. I got all kinds of notes here. And, but as the Lord, as the Holy Spirit directs some of these notes, why did I write that down? <laughs> the Lord says, no, I want you to talk about this. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so good to be in the Lord, I tell you. I wouldn't give it up for anything. I've been with the Lord for about 60 years. Oh, hallelujah. And I, I never, never doubted. Oh, I got discouraged like everybody else, but always came back to him. That's, that's the beauty of it. When we are faithful to him, he's faithful to us, and he will provide whatever we need. Just reach out to him. And I expect for him, from him to be completely healed. Hallelujah. <laughs> and the same thing for my wife. We're crying out to him for miracles, Lord, as you know. We expect it to happen. How? Well, that's up to him. But we expect it to happen. And that's what we should do. Expect good things from your Lord. Expect it. Expect it. Don't just come in here and be entertained or anything like that. Come expecting that the Lord will give you something today. And I hope that he gave you something today, what I, not what I said, but what the Spirit said to you. Many times you, you, you say something and you ask the people, well, what did you get out of it? They come up with a, huh, I never talked about that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit spoke to them. <laughs> That's the important part. That's good. That's what it's all about. So, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity in your Jesus' name that you allowed me to be here and to bring your word. And I pray that it bears fruit for your honor and for your glory, and that we are willing to be that light that you want us to be in this dark world, that we are that hope that the world needs because of you, Lord, that people see you in us and that we are able to minister to them in love and really rejoicing with them as they accept you as their personal Savior. We want to bear a lot of fruit for you, Lord, before you come. As we've seen in your word, there's many signs that have been already shown us of your coming again. And there are probably more signs coming yet, Lord, but we expect you to come. But in the meantime, you don't want us just to sit at home and having our suitcase filled and waiting for you to just travel with you. Know that we may go out and disciple, go out, evangelize, go out to bring people into your kingdom, Lord, to keep busy until you come. May that be our goal, to honor and glorify you, to make you our priority and to reach out to others. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. And I pray for these people here, Lord. Bless them to this day. Cover them with your love, Lord Jesus. And let the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.